Good morning. This is Father Tom Alionic from St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Kinderhook, New York. And thank you for your patience. Uh, if you've been hanging out waiting for the morning musings at 10 o'clock, I apologize for the delay. I seem to be having some trouble now. Uh, I tried an experiment over the weekend uh, trying to get in and trying the option of using YouTube Live. And ever since then, I have not been able to get into Facebook Live through uh, OBS, which is the, um, the streaming uh, package, the software that I've been using that kind of helps to make this a multimedia kind of event. I tried to do this uh, particularly for Sundays um, <coughs> uh, so that I can incorporate other readers and I can have music and so on in addition to the live content. Uh, and that requires using something like OBS um, to... Uh, to funnel stuff into Facebook. But now Facebook just doesn't let me connect to the server, and I'm not quite sure why. So anyway, good morning. This is Morning Musings. Uh, this is our reflections on the texts of the Daily Office or just about anything else that comes to mind. Um, and again, uh, just as a reminder to everybody that our, our goal with these Morning Musings is is not to acquire speculative knowledge. It's not just to accumulate information. It's not to satisfy our intellectual curiosity. It, it might do that. Uh, it's not a forum for just um, uh, exchanging opinions uh, so much as it really is. It's an effort for us to enter together into a conversation with one another, but also with the scriptures, with God through the scriptures, a conversation that will deepen our life in Christ, something that will address the areas of our life that that God is trying to address through these scriptures. Uh, it's granted, um, you know, very much dependent on on kind of what I think is is uh, jumping out on a given day. That's partly, I guess, because that's my job as the rector of the parish. I'm, I'm supposed to, uh, to try to keep my finger on such things. Uh, if there are specific questions, if there are specific areas of your spiritual life that you feel like these texts have addressed in some way to you, um, then by all means, if that's something that you're really struggling with growing through, if, if you feel like, you know, God has, has um, raised something that all of a sudden you, you had not considered before, but that might be important to you in your living out of the Christian life. The important thing that I want to, to get across is that this is for, this is really for us. This is for us as we try to live. It's, we're not trying to come up with a, uh, a package that we can present to the rest of the Christian world or even to the rest of our parish. Um, we're not trying to, to formulate larger um, ideas uh, that we can then market or, or sell or whatever. It's about our own personal spiritual growth. And that, of course, will feed into the growth and the life of our parish. But it's not really... Um, it's not really something that's designed. We're not here to critique society. We're not here to, to fix the world's problems. We are here to become better disciples of Jesus Christ, and we're here to become um, uh, better apostles that he can send out into the world to love the world uh, first and foremost. So that's what, we are, that's what we are really, really about here. We're about, we're about trying to become more mature as Christians rather than to, to tell other people how they should become more mature as Christians. So anyway, to, to, um, um, to dive right into it, um, <coughs> we, had, we had two readings this morning uh, in the Office of Morning Prayer. We had one from the Book of Ecclesiastes, uh, or Coaleth, the preacher, and we had a reading from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians. And the reading from Ecclesiastes is the famous one, uh, where the, the preacher, the writer, uh, presumably, or at least, um, you know, perhaps just in a, as an adopted persona, persona, it seems to be a wise king like Solomon. And so, um, so he's complaining that all is vanity, vanity. Um, what is the, something somebody once quipped, you know, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Vanity of vanities, that expression, ex something of somethings, king of kings, lord of lords, vanity of vanities means the greatest vanity, um, the, the supreme vanity, 
all is vanity. In other words, all is futile. There's, there's no matter how hard you try, you don't get anywhere. Um, that there's, that there's, there's nothing to be gained from <coughs> the various different approaches that, that this guy lays, lays out that he has tried. And so in this particular passage, he's complaining about that. Vanitas vanitatum. As somebody once said, vanitas vanitatum from the top to the bottom. Um, vanity of vanity is always vanity. Now, the interesting thing about this word vanity, the Hebrew word for vanity, hevel, um, hevel is also the name Abel, as in Cain and Abel. Right? Eve names her son vanity, futility. Um, so there's this, this strange kind of connection that, that human life is folly, um, that there's nothing to be gained. And, and that's part of what happens to Abel. For all of his sacrifices, for all of the fact that God seemed to like his sacrifices or his offerings better than Cain's, what did it get him? He got killed, right? He dies. And no matter how much we, no matter how much we do, we can't, we can't do anything for ourselves to escape that fate. That is something that has that we have inherited just by being human, just, just by having uh, been born as descendants of our first parents who themselves decided that rather than ally themselves and align themselves and remain dependent upon the source of life, would go off and try to find some other source of fulfillment, some other source of um, achieving <coughs> The, uh, the glorious state that, that they felt they were entitled to, that they, they haven't actually, in fact, had been promised, that God, God wants creation to develop under, under human guidance, under human care, uh, to develop and to become perfected and to reach this, this incredible state of glory. Uh, but the first human beings decided, no, they would take a different path. And so all of us now are on that different path. We can be removed from that path, but we can't get ourselves off of it. We are kind of stuck in this, on this track, on this rut, and we have to be lifted up and taken and put on a different path. We have to be turned around by some outside agency. The outside agency being God acting in the world through Jesus Christ. And God acting in the world through Jesus Christ and those whom Jesus Christ has called and sent and appointed to continue that work down through the ages. So we're privileged in our own day and age, in our own day and age, in our own lives, to have been placed on a different path. Uh, we keep wanting to, to go back to the old one because it's familiar. We keep wanting to go back to the old one because the same tempter is still there giving us the same message. You know, if you just, just ignore God a little bit over here, you know, and then, then life will be a whole lot easier for you. That temptation is still with us very powerfully and very strongly. Anyway, um, so Eve has named her her first son, her, her son, um, rather Abel, has named him Vanity. And now we have Ecclesiastes, the our great ruler. He's got wealth. He's got everything possible. He's got wealth. He's got learning. He's intelligent. Um, he is, um, you know, he lacks for nothing. And yet at the same time, he looks and he says, here I am with all this wisdom. Here I am with all this wealth. Here I am with all these pleasures in my life. And I'm going to die just as surely as the fool next door. So what does it get me? Why, why bother? He asks himself. Um, and the answer to that question is not something that he actually comes up with. In the end, he concludes, well, might as well eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we're all going to die anyway. Um, and of course there's more to it than that. Uh, certainly there is, there is more to it than that. But at, at that juncture, right, the world doesn't have the definitive answer. And the answer is given to us actually, I think, in this letter of Paul to the Galatians. And if you consider, um, first of all, that what we have in this letter to the Galatians is probably the very first 
written words of what would become the New Testament. This is probably the earliest thing written that got collected into uh, what we think of now as the New Testament writings. This is one of the oldest pieces. This is Paul's, Galatians is, is recognized generally as being Paul's first letter. Um, and it's the first thing that he wrote. And of all the people who wrote, whose writings got collected in, into the New Testament, it was Paul who did the earliest writing among them. Excuse me. Um, but what is Paul about? Paul has been called by Jesus Christ, and he has been sent out to be a missionary. And over and over again, you will find this. You find this in his letter to the Galatians, and you find it in all of his other letters. Paul is living not for himself. He is he doesn't he he is he puts himself in second and sometimes in last place his whole concern is for the well-being the spiritual well-being the salvation of others and that's the answer that's the answer to the question of vanity yeah it isn't that by doing x y or z or by uh, avoiding x y or z i can therefore have life for myself but rather that it is in giving away my life. It is in not clinging to my life. It is in living for others. It is living so that others may live. It is living so that others may have this life. It is living so that others may have this, this benefit of knowing Jesus Christ this, and, and, and being connected to the source of life. It is in doing that that I become alive myself. Um, Simon Tugwell, a uh, British Dominican whose, whose uh, writings I greatly enjoy and have been, have been uh, really educated by, I think, in, in my faith, he brings up, he brings up two, two different metaphors for how, that, how grace works in the life of a Christian. He says the, the one metaphor that we often use is the metaphor of a bowl, is we wait for God to fill us up, and then when we're full, when we're all full, then we spill out over the brim, and then it, it trickles down to other people. And that's, so we get filled first, and then when we're full, we share with others. But he says the other, the other metaphor, and the one that I prefer, the one that I like, is the metaphor of the, um, the ceramic or the, the, the terracotta pipe, like an old Roman viaduct. They have these terracotta pipes. And it is in letting the water flow through from point A to point B downstream to the people who are going to use it downstream, it is in the process of conducting that water to them that the ceramic pipe itself absorbs water and becomes saturated. And that I think is, that I think is more the way we operate as Christians. Not that we, be, we get filled up first and then once we're okay, then we go off and we live for other people, but rather we live for other people and in the course of doing that, we forget our life. And in the course of forgetting our life, we find the life that God wants to give us, the life that God has in store for us, the life that is full of joy precisely because it is not focused in on our discontents, because we're not constantly keeping track of what we lack, because we're not constantly worrying about what we're going to run out of, but rather trusting that the, the source of life is inexhaustible coming from God that in passing that on repeatedly over and over and over again, in doing all of that, we ourselves wind up getting filled up. We ourselves wind up becoming saturated. Right? We become watered not first so that we can then give to others, but rather we become watered in the course of giving to others. And that's what Paul, that's what Paul is really, I think, talking about. Um, <clears throat> that the purpose of my life in Christ is not so that I can have life in Christ. The purpose of my life in Christ is that someone else may have life in Christ and that I have my life. Um, so that's, I think, 
that's I think kind of the key realization, and and it helps us I think even as we even as we study the history of the church, even as we study the development of the churches, whether it's in the New Testament and New Testament times, or the whether the, it's the subsequent history of the church, we don't study the history of the church for methodology and technique. Um, we don't study in order to make sure we don't make the same mistakes that others made. What we do is we we I think look at least more fruitfully I think we look for a sense a growing sense of realization that oh my gosh what I have has come down to me despite all of those mistakes despite all of the error despite all of the misguided stuff that the church has done and people in the church have done despite all of that nevertheless it has come down it has actually managed to reach little old me um, so that, that when we, when I read, when I read the, the history of the church, when I read, uh, the writings of the saints, like Justin, for example, Justin got martyred, he got killed, right? but he left us a record that tells us something about how the church continued to pass on the message and how the church continues to, to find ways to tell subsequent generations, how the church finds ways to tell people, it's contemporaries, but also people in subsequent generations about Jesus Christ. It's, um, it's a way of, of looking at the history of the church to find occasions for gratitude for the people who may not have gotten it all right themselves, but who nevertheless gave everything so that someone else downstream, and ultimately me, and ultimately those who come after me, so that someone downstream could have the benefit of life in Christ. So that when we look at even things like Paul is talking about here, he's talking about the law, even when we look at things like the law, we're looking at it not in terms of what can we get away with, um, you know, what loopholes are there, what's no longer, you know, which, which, which laws have been repealed, which have been uh, suspended, and so on. Uh, what do we not have to do? Uh, and, and what's the least that we can get away with, with doing so that it counts, so to speak. But rather, again, to give us a sense of, my gosh, people went to this much trouble to make sure that this life got passed on. People went to this much trouble to make sure that their, their children and their children's children would know the story, would hear the words, would understand symbolically in ways that appeal not only to the, the linear, rational mind, but also to the heart and to the spirit uh, that would become even muscle memory. People went to that much trouble to construct ways and to hand on, to pass on ways of passing on that life. So in a, in a sense, um, you know, uh, we tend to think that what Paul was saying to folks like the Galatians, right, is that look the the law is that the law is um, not applicable to you. Um, certainly, the Mosaic Law would not have been. They didn't have the same history. The people of Galatia, Galatia was a huge province, by the way, in, the, in sort of in the center of, of of what we now think of as Turkey, as Asia Minor. When we think of that list of people that were that were um, mentioned in Acts yesterday in the reading of um, reading from Acts about the day of Pentecost, right? And it goes through that long list of all those people, people from Pisidia, um, from Pontus and Asia and so on. Those were all provinces in that, that general region. The Galazi, uh, the word Galazi, by the way, this is, this is, this is just a fun fact, uh, but the word Galazi, that Galata, thing is the same root as we have in the word Celt and Celtic. Uh, and they were a Celt, they were Celtic speaking peoples in Asia Minor, and they're related to the peoples of Britain, Northern, uh, Northern France, Britain, Ireland, uh, Scotland, and so on. Uh, it's the, it was that same language family, uh, that same ethnic stock uh, of Celts. So the Galati are Celts. Uh, at least some of them were, and there's some dispute over over which of them Paul was actually writing to, because the Romans just named the province Galatia, 
you know, where the where the Galatsi lived, but there were a whole bunch of other people there as well. Anyway, so Paul's talking about Paul is talking about the law. And 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 there is there are certainly ways in which it's probably not meaningful to the Galatsi to study in great detail, certainly not for them to learn and to try to mimic the ways of passing on the message that worked for the Jews in Jerusalem, say, or the Jews even of the diaspora. And there's some question, maybe Jew, maybe um, Paul was writing to the Jews of the diaspora. But if they were Gentiles, uh, if they were non-Jews, then certainly all of that, all of that history, um, they don't have to first go back and assimilate all of that history and take on all of that cultural baggage and so on in order to then find their life in Christ. Um, but by the same token, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that that when Paul is talking here about um, not letting somebody preach to them a gospel other than the one he was preaching, that he's necessarily at this point in his letter to the Galatians making an argument about uh, the futility, the vanity, if you will, uh, of uh, trying to achieve salvation under the law. There's two things going on here, I think. Uh, for one thing, um, I don't know. I don't know whether whether this comes out well in Paul or not. But I think there's there's some difficulty in a a, a cut and dried uh, kind of uh, facile cut and dried distinction between ritual and moral elements in the law. I think there's there's a greater there's a greater intermingling of those two, and that it's harder to tease apart what is ritual and what is moral. And perhaps the details of the rituals don't matter, but we can't do without ritual altogether. There's no, there's no relationship with anybody that doesn't re rely on a certain amount of predictability uh, and consistency and repetition. Um, but anyway, um, what I think, you know, uh, the the mindset that I think Paul is arguing against here is the, the idea um, it, the idea that, that you can somehow manipulate God the way, the way anyone would manipulate their local deity or their local idol by the, the, the strict minute observance of, of uh, very particular kinds of, of rituals. Right. If you go full bore, obsessive compulsive about this and make just the right sacrifices at just the right time with saying just the right words in just the right way, that somehow God's hands are tied and he has to act. Uh, and that's the kind of mindset that, that is very easy to fall into. Right? That God is concerned about um, the superficialities of observance. That, that turns the relationship with God into something very much like a legal one, right? And it leaves us with the false impression that, um, you know, that, that whoever has the best, whoever can make the best technical argument wins. Whoever can point to, well, I did X, I checked all the boxes here, God, so therefore you have to do what you promised to do. Um, I think the, uh, the book of Job is the answer to that question. Uh, Job did everything right and still uh, things escape us. So I don't think I don't think Paul is really talking about uh, the um, uh, completely throwing out the idea of of ritual observance or uh, devotional practice or uh, or for that matter, even encapsulating or codifying or, or putting the um, the new wine of the um, of the gospel. Uh, of somehow being able to transmit that without a container of some sort. There is always going to be a need for containers. Uh, Paul himself would make a, would, would go on later uh, in his letter to the Corinthians. Uh, he would go on much later to talk about he received from the Lord what he handed what, what he handed on to you, uh, Corinthians, that I received this from the Lord, that he took bread that he took wine. He said, this is my body, this is my blood. And he said, do this. So even Paul acknowledges that there are, there are some things that are, are fixed and set. But I think what he is saying is that, is that what gets fixed and set 
may be different for, uh, for the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem or in the diaspora and different for the Gentiles. But that nevertheless, the one, it is, it's one and the same Lord governing both. He's arguing for diversity, not for absence uh, of, of any kind of requirements like that. The other thing that, that we, I think, get into trouble with in, in this, particularly in this section of Paul's letter to the Galatians, uh, he makes a big deal about saying, oh, look, I got this, from, I got this from, uh, from Jesus Christ directly. I didn't need uh, to go to Jerusalem. I didn't need to hear it from the other apostles and whatever. And, and this is not, I don't think, Paul saying, hey, we don't need no stinking hier hierarchy. Um, but what he is emphasizing to the Galatians is that, look, this gospel you were preached is not something that anybody made up, not the apostles in Jerusalem and not he himself, Paul. We didn't make this up. That's what he's really telling them. Um, you know, he was, he admits that it was by grace. It was by God's sheer choice that he was given this message without human intervention, at least initially. Um, the, that sort of initial blinding realization that, oh my gosh, I have been wrong my entire life. I have built my entire life on upholding these values and convictions that are so near and dear to me and so deeply a part, um, uh, so deeply a part of who I am and my identity. And oh my gosh, I've been wrong about all of that. Uh, even after that initial realization came to him through, through no human agency, but through a direct encounter with Jesus Christ, even after that, Paul had to go to Damascus and spend time with the Christian community there. Um, he did have to uh, become enculturated in this new way of being Jewish, acknowledging Jesus as Lord, uh, Jesus as the Messiah. Um, he still had to have the scales removed from his eyes by somebody else. Uh, Jesus did not uh, kind of meet him on the road to Damascus, and then all of a sudden he just showed up elsewhere as an apostle. He needed time to assimilate what the Christian community could communicate to him. Um, and so he's not also telling the Galatians that they shouldn't trust any, you know, human, um, human transmission of the Gospels. He's not saying that human agency has no role to play, that, that only what God tells you from the inside of your heart upward, um, that it's only what wells up from within or from, from the, uh, the divine spark at the core of your being that that's the only authentic gospel you need to worry about. Because that's Paul's life himself. Paul's whole life is going out and telling other people about Jesus Christ. He was commissioned to be an apostle, um, not to be an advocate for do-it-yourself Christianity, not to be an advocate for, uh, uh, for, the, for the divine spark as the source of, of truth. Um, he's very clear about what is true and what is not true. And... And the need for unity is another thing that continually comes up in Paul. I think as he, as he sees the, the tendencies, particularly in the communities that he has founded, for people to come up as charismatic individuals to say, I have gotten an inspiration from God. God has given me the truth to tell you, here it is. And, uh, and he has seen more than, he will, by the time he dies, has, have seen more than one of his communities troubled by people like that, rising up from within and acquiring a following. Uh, because what they say is is really uh, plausible and exciting and enticing, but it's not the gospel. And so he's very clear and becomes more and more and more clear over the course of his life. He becomes more and more clear about the need for unity among the churches. And he's also very concerned with maintaining ties with the church in, in Jerusalem. Uh, he believes that, um, that there should be a, a certain equality between the Jewish churches and the um, the Gentile churches. The Jewish churches are on their way to being kicked out of the synagogue. Um, that would happen in, in 70 AD. Um, but the Jewish community there can't make the leap from Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of, of Nazareth was a, a nice guy, maybe a prophet. He said a lot of cool stuff and he did a lot of cool things to Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Adonai. Jesus is God. Um, so... <clears throat> Uh, so, so Paul is not arguing against um, human transmission of the gospel. He's not arguing against the use of traditions 
as a way of transmitting, uh, of handing on, of traditio as the action of handing on the gospel. Um, instead, what he's really emphasizing is that this is not made up by human beings. This is something God has revealed. Uh, every bit as God, every bit as much as God revealed the law of Moses to the Jews, God is revealing this to Jew and Gentile alike now in our latter day, um, and that God is overcoming that division between Jews who, who previously had been set apart and given that revelation. Now Paul describes himself as having been set apart in the same way, made holy, made special for a particular purpose. And the particular pur purpose is that is to, to live for the sake of others, to live for the sake of others having this life. That's what we do as Christians, not just as individual Christians, but that's what our parishes do. That's what our churches do. Our churches are supposed to be not places where we gather together and enjoy being Christian with one another. Our churches are places where we gather together to find ways to take that message outward to our contemporaries and find ways to make sure that that message gets passed on to those who come after us. That's, our, that's, that's the commission that we have been given. That's the life that we have been given. It's the way we absorb life by being a conduit of life to others. It's how we have our own life. So that's, that's a, a kind of rambly assemblage of things. Um, and uh, I'll, let, me, let me take a look. Um, uh, oh, hi, Penny. And hi, Steve. Uh, Kathy, I'm, are you still there? I'm not sure. Uh, and uh, Diane, thank you for joining. I'm not sure again whether you're still here. I think, uh, Steve, I'm not entirely sure, but I think um, the book by Tugwell maybe that I'm thinking of is The Way of Imperfection. Uh, but I'd have to... I'd have to look. I'd have to take a look at that. Um, and uh, uh, let's see. Grace getting thrown off his horse. Why Arabia monastic? Really? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I haven't. I haven't gotten that far. Uh, anyway, those are good questions, though. Uh, anyway, if if there's if there's any of this that has been useful to you, I am I am grateful and I'm glad to have been part of it. Uh, and so take what take whatever it is God speaks to you through, and uh, and let the other let the rest of it go on to somebody else. Um, I'm continuing to troubleshoot the technology. I don't know still what is what is wrong with it, so I'm going to have to do some some significant uh, rooting around in this. Thank you for your patience. I think the audio would have been okay today because I'm just doing a live connection feed. And I think there's something else going on with OBS that's distorting the microphone. Anyway, thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. God bless you all. Um, I look forward to being with you again, uh, both for prayers and for morning musings, uh, hopefully tomorrow, God willing. Uh, God bless you, and I pray that you have a, a safe and productive and fulfilling day.